So, uh, let me just jump in here and introduce, I'll start with Jesse Berger, who is our director making his debut. <laughs> Jesse lives in New York City, uh, where he has founded a theater company called the Red Bull Theater, which is dedicated to the works of Shea, uh, Elizabethan and Jacobean playwrights, and now Jean Genet. How that fits in, we don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, you'll have to tell us. Jesse grew up in the West, in Oregon, went to school in Utah, worked at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Utah Shakespearean Festival, then off to the East Coast, uh, where he worked with Michael Kahn at the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, D.C., worked at the Globe in San Diego, Denver Center, on and on and on. Great companies all, the Guthrie, where he worked with Garland Wright. And so comes, in some ways, you know, uh, like many of the directors particularly, but actors too in our company, through the ranks of really the top tier Shakespeare companies. Uh, you'll remember that Sari Ketter and Bart Cher and Risa Brainin, all three share this background at the Guthrie with the great late uh, Garland Wright and, and Jesse as well. Lise um, Bruneau, also making her debut this season, you just saw in The Imaginary Invalid as Belene, and she'll be playing her mom. So to me, the play, the play strikes a deep chord of, our, our, of what it means to be human beings and how we get through good times and bad times and also how we participate in the theater uh, in particular, which really requires an act of faith, which we call imagination. So Another key to the play for me is this little boy, Mamilius, who is the son of Hermione and Leontes. And, uh, and, and so many of the things that happen in the play that are 
that you that you recognize from from uh, um, from hearing about the play, like "Exit Pursued by a Bear," uh, things like that, struck me as being directly out of a child's imagination. And so that aspect of the play, that is almost as if it's a, an old tale seen through a child's eyes, really resonated with me. And so you'll see some of that in the production as well. Um, Jesse, the the design of the production plays into that into that decision very clearly. Um, you know, there is really a sense of fairy tale. There's a sense of us viewing the play through Memelius's eyes. But we talk a little bit about the designs are also really intriguingly eclectic. And you know, we, we're ranging clearly from 19th century references to English 19th century Dickens, very strongly at, at the top of the second act, to what feel like very much uh, ethnic influences. Russia, we feel in the play, clearly when we go to Bohemia, we have a world of gypsies and of yeah. all of that, that folklore. Yeah. But talk to us a little bit about developing design approach. Sure, sure. Well, well, going off that impulse of being sort of a, a jumping off point of the child's imagination, we immediately went towards sort of the Hans Christian Andersen and, and the great fables that we grow up knowing. Uh, and also, um, just before he died, ironically, Maurice Sendak was in my mind, that sense of uh, where the wild things are, and that sense of the little boy who, uh, and uh, you know, as a child of divorce, I suppose this resonated deeply for me, the little boy who, you know, sees his parents fighting and then goes up to the bedroom, or, you know, I don't even remember where the, where the wild things are, his plot, but goes up to the bedroom and then bears and trees grow, and suddenly you're in this nightmare world. So it, 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 the jumping off point came from there. And, and I really felt strongly, and the designers and I agreed, and I think David Barber, our set designer, and Sarah Tassetti, our costume designer, have just done a gorgeous job realizing this. Um, really thought that the play wanted to live in a period that was pre-20th century, something that would enable us to see these characters in the, in the sort of fable of love and loss and forgiveness that they're in uh, without, without feeling too much like it had to be uh, um, a corporate boardroom or something that would make us draw all sorts of contemporary analogies all the time. It has deeper, more universal, timeless truths to talk to, uh, to speak to as a play. And so we set it further back. And then, and then the eclecticism that Charlie's talking about was, was, first of all, just taking Shakespeare at his word. One half of the play is set in a place called Bohemia that probably never existed except in Shakespeare's imagination, but we think it was somewhere like Croatia. And that kind of led us to Croatian folk dancing and, and music that's a little bit inspired by that world. And then, uh, and then Sicilia, where, um, where it's, a, it's a much more formal world that Shakespeare wrote. And so it has sort of elements of Sicilian, um, uh, I don't know what's a, a gangster's not the right word. <laughs> but Totalitarian. Totalitarianism. Totalitarianism. Which, which seemed to play into some of the Dickens uh, things that you saw, I think. Uh -huh. Um, so it is eclectic and it is an attempt to create an imaginary world like you might find in a storybook or a fable or even like uh, Mother Goose, uh, you, you know, where there's a real uh, drawing from all cultures to try to have something that is universal and uh, feels like a period production but really isn't set in any particular year other than to say late 19th century-ish. And one of the things that I think is just so beautiful about Jesse's concepts and, and these ideas is that when you're immersed in this kind of storybook world, all of the fantastic things that happen in the play don't freak you out so much. You know what I mean? Like if everything is very realistic and very clear, then you'll see a detail that doesn't quite jive with your idea of reality and it can really throw you off. Whereas here, it takes you five minutes to realize that kind of anything goes, you know? I mean, you're seeing these extraordinary set pieces and people's you know, hair colors that are just a bit odd and things like that. And I think it just kind of opens your imagination to allowing a lot more in. Yeah, and this is a play in which we're, we say we're in Sicilia, we say we're in Bohemia, and we wait for the Delphic Oracle <laughs> yes. to deliver the truth, exactly. which takes us, you know, right back to ancient Greece. Right. I mean, so where is Shakespeare placing it, as he does often? He places it in a very universalized yeah. mm -hmm. um, And he plays world. fast, that's uh, exactly, and he plays fast and loose with whether, um, you know, with, with uh, what's real and what's true. And one of the things we talked about in rehearsal was sort of sometimes uh, what's most, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for, what's, what's mo what seems most unreal is actually more true than realism, if you know what I mean. And we're just really talking about myth. The and women in Shakespeare's plays are, 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 you know, in very different positions if you're in a comedy, or if you're in a tragedy or history. Mm -hmm. 
right? I mean, you know, the experience of Lady Macbeth is very different than the experience of Rosalind. And that sort of holds true. The comedy tends to be stories about women and their search and their voice. Now we're in this late period of Shakespeare, and it's really, well, I mean, where are we? A comedy? A tragedy? You know, and where does Hermione fit in this? You know, where, what does she feel like in relationship to this play? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, wow. The, the issue with Hermione is that she can seem so boring. Because she is good, and she is grace, and she is love, and she is mother, and she's all these fantastic things. And you're like, oh, come on, why doesn't she do something? But she has this total faith that, um, that because she is true, and because she is honest, and because she hasn't done anything wrong, that bad things will not happen to her. She believes that with all of her heart. Guess what? Really bad things happen to her. Really bad things. So that's the journey for me, is to sort of find out what happens when you've got this tried and true, absolutely, you know, bulletproof understanding of the world that then changes, and that changes you, and that changes your entire approach to how you deal with day-to-day -day life, because it does keep getting worse and worse and worse. Um, but in the very first scene, it's almost like a comedy. Everything's beautiful, everything's great, everyone's happy, beautiful family, handsome husband, you know, what, what could possibly go wrong? And as, as a friend of mine said, her favorite part of a tragedy is the moment where the character that's the victim of everything goes, that was weird. <laughs> you know, it's not sort of like you've read the play and you know, oh, Yago is going to do this terrible thing to my imagination or whatever. You just sort of like, that was weird. And then you have a nice long journey of discovery, you know, of, of the darkness that, that is seeping through the play that then hopefully will come out to something beautiful in the end. Yes, and in this play we have uh, one of the most theatrical kinds of events that can take place. As opposed to moving from, that was weird, to development, and maybe we see something coming, and a little more information about why Yago's doing this, <laughs> and why Macbeths are plotting this way. This play goes from, that was weird, to, whoop, it's done. <laughs> yep. And that's your character. And Leontes <laughs> sits in again a very interesting uh, kind of tension between tragedy and comedy, and that's the world we're in now with Shakespeare. None of the late plays can really be said to be either thing wholly, um, except that there is forgiveness, right? David, you've played lots of these guys from Iago, you know, on, on down through those guys, um, and does Leontes does he feel like a tragic person, a tragic character to you, or, you know, what, what is this? I, this has been the ultimate challenge, I think. I've never, I've never had a journey quite like this. I did it kind of last night, the first run, and I had 25 pounds of costume, and I came off from the, kind of, he just is in these first four scenes, but talks for about 30 minutes stage time, and I was drenched, drenched, and that doesn't usually happen to me. It didn't happen to me with Iago. I don't even think it happened with Hamlet. Any role I've ever played, um, the heightened speaking, but there's a great chance for this journey, this redemption. You only, I think, you only really other uh, the only other play that you see this in is Pericles, where you have a chance to to truly reinvent yourself, to be a person in the first half of the play, and then to learn from the incredible uh, hubris, incredible flaw of, the, of this jealousy that he experiences. So it's been wonderful to work with Jesse on it because I watched a few DVDs and I watched a few people play it and I think we hit on this one, these two words that he says in his first soliloquy, tremor cordis. And it literally means in Latin, heart tremor. And then it just pops up again and again and again. This, this session pushes against our heart while she lives. My heart will be a burden to me the heir apparent to my heart. He keeps mentioning this. So this idea of seeing this vision, your wife with your best friend, and all of a sudden just seeing something that goes, wait a minute, am I seeing what I just thought? What's happening to me? And if we've ever experienced jealousy, <laughs> oh, what an emotion. It's just, uh, if you've ever 
truly experience jealousy. It's one of the worst, most ugly, evil. I mean, more than envy, it's it's oh, to feel like you're being cuckolded. And we it's, have, I mean, we have horrible. these two great plays about jealousy, right? Othello and and this. Now, this is in the most every in the most comic vein, Mary Wise. But oh, <laughs> sure. I mean, that is. But yes, the, those two plays, and in both plays, uh, there is the experience for Othello of you know a seizure, right? He yes. had, it creates a seizure. We don't know whether it's epilepsy, yeah. tremor cordis, but for Shakespeare, it always manifests itself seemingly in this just total physical break. Yeah. Yes, right. Disease. Break. Disease. Yeah, disease. Yeah. Infection. Yeah. Infection. Yeah. Although in Othello, it's being worked upon him, yes. and in Leontes, it's a vision. It, it, it's a disease he catches on his own. And like the Scottish guy, you don't really get to see what Leontes yeah. was like kind of before the play. I mean, you're right. it's 12 lines in, and bam. Yeah. In Othello, you get to see an outside external force, Iago, working on uh, Othello. And it and takes here, the whole play. Yeah, here, I really think Shakespeare wanted to make it more like the every, every man. He says, many thousands of us. And at London, the population was 250,000. So if you're saying, he's saying like, hey, a tenth of London right now, your wife is sleeping around on you. <laughs> no, really? That's what he says. It was a body age. <laughs> a body planet. A body planet. That's what he says. A body planet. Yes, but Jesse yeah. and, you know, and, and, and Lees and David, you have to, you have to grapple with the fact that this is one of the most sudden and purposefully unexplained breaks that we see in Shakespeare. There's almost nothing that compares to this event in, in the Shakespeare plays. As in a way, while there are other kinds of events, just the ending is very, very unique as well, right? And again, defies rational explanation. So how did you, Jesse and, and the, you know, Lisa and David, how did you approach this very central problem? The beginning or the ending? Well, <laughs> I don't want to give away the ending. If spoiler alert! Spoiler! No. no, let's not give away the ending. Let me just say that Shakespeare plays fast and loose with, uh, with what's real and what's not real, even at the ending. Um, and, and in a way, we, we've tried to have our cake and eat it too, for those of you who know the play, the way that Shakespeare does. We've tried to embrace both things both the real, both what's real about it and what's mythic about it. In terms of the beginning of the play, I might be too literal about this, but I think we, I take Shakespeare at face value in the same way that a character like Proteus in a very early play of Shakespeare's of Two Gentlemen of Verona turns on a dime at the end, begs forgiveness, and is forgiven. Um, it happens the same way at the beginning in this play for Leontes, and so that's the analogy I would draw. To me, it happens in that moment, and I, you know, I can't, has anyone never been, uh, Dangerously jealous. Can you raise your hand if you've never been dangerously jealous? I recognize it because we've all been there. And all it takes is all it takes is seeing the one thing, him holding her hand in the wrong way or whatever it is. And suddenly everything else you've seen for the last nine months is how long uh, Polixenes is visiting Leontes. For the last nine months, and she happens to be almost nine months pregnant. <sighs> suddenly he's sucked back through a time machine, in a way, and sees every little thing that happened along that road of those nine months. I, 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 to me, it's totally realistic. Yes. Uh, so that's how, that's how I approached it in talking with DA about it. Um, and, and fair enough, yeah. right? And, and I feel, I feel yeah. very much the same way, yeah. right? That it doesn't, I take Shakespeare at face value, yeah. right? I don't spend a lot of time on Proteus saying, what in your childhood makes it possible <laughs> yeah. that when you see Sylvia, you're instantly in love with her? It's because that's the way life is. However, that isn't to say that people don't always ask about this question sure. and wonder, did you, do you to say to yourself, I'm going to build a backstory for of the nine months that have been playing out here in this court with you entertaining your best friend Polixenes and your wife becoming pregnant during that period. And was that something that, that you did feel you, you wanted to and needed to explore? Well, it's actually, yeah, it was wonderful. And this is, this is one of the joys of, of being able to play the same role several times is that my other husbands um, actually <laughs> did find a dark past. 
you know, they did, they did find um, a little bit of tension in the marriage, um, perhaps a history of some violence, um, and there are a couple of lines that then turned from, you know, oh, you look as if you held a brow of much distraction, to you look as if you held a brow of much distraction. <laughs> you know, exactly. Um, and you have the choice, and that's another thing with the romances and some of Shakespeare's more, you know, genius plays, that, uh, that you actually have the choice that is not contradicted. Um, sometimes it's very clear what you have to do and you don't have a choice in the matter unless you cut the heck out of it. But, um, but other times you've just got a little leeway. So because we don't have a lot of information about Leontes' history, um, we decided this time that it was out of the blue, 100%, which means that Hermione is dealing with something that she never suspected, never seen before, that it's, it's all completely shocking and new, which is a, a really fun way yeah. to go through it and just a whole different journey. Why did they call it Winter's Tale? Is there a connection? Question. Why is it called the Winter's Tale? There's a, uh, what's the line in the play? Uh, a, a, a sad tale is best for winter. Uh, you know, it's a good question. We don't know why Shakespeare named it the Winter's Tale, but he did call it, I always find it interesting, the Winter's Tale, not a Winter's Tale. You know, it's like the tale to end all tales. You know, and so, I mean, it's, a, it's, an, old, it's an old fable. I think that's the phrase. Uh, do you remember anything else from this? Like Scotland? an old wives' tale. An old wives' tale, in a way. You also read in the Arden, you hear at Paulinus says, you winners all. They said that the Elizabethan audience also would have heard winners in a winner's tale at the end. But also winters, of course, when everything dies, mm -hmm. and then it is reborn. Reborn. Perdita uh, is, yeah, Seasons. is sort of likened with uh, Persephone, who is taken away from her mother. And, uh, you know, in fury, you know, Demeter just locks everything down while the daughter is gone, and then when Hades returns the daughter right. to her, that's spring and summer, and then fall and winter is when the daughter goes back to the yeah. underworld. So that's part of it. And, you know, when, when yeah. Leontes meets his daughter for the first time, he says, welcome hither as is the spring Great. to the earth. Mm. That guy, he read his fables. He, he read his <laughs> Audiences of all time, Shakespeare's as well, have had a difficult uh, time dealing with plays of blended tonality. It's not a comedy. It is a comedy. It's not a tragedy. Oh, now it feels tragic. That blend of the comic and the tragic j just seems to be difficult for people to reconcile. It's been hard for critics to reconcile. Um, and it's one of the things that, you know, Shakespeare went wildly out of fashion uh, during the neoclassical period. The French just despised him for his seeming unruliness as a writer. And the most unruly of those plays are these late romances. Yeah, but we see it in Measure for Measure. We see it even in The Merchant of Venice. We've seen it from early in his writing that he's never going to just be either comic or tragic. But that's tough because it's not a simple idea. Exactly, because mm -hmm. the, the, you don't know what's expected of you as an audience member. And he makes fun of it with, in Hamlet. Polonius makes fun of it. Absolutely. Tragical, oh, pastoral, pastoral, historical, historical, historical comedy. And yet, he said historical. about now knowing when to laugh or when to cry is one of the great joys of the play is at the end when laughter and tears are totally commingling. And he's playing with it all through the last act of this play. It's all about how uh, joy and sorrow are, are intertwined. And, and death and rebirth is part of the, the yeah. At any rate, uh, last one's our Gregory Young. Just speaking of those two extremely different countries that this play takes in, other productions I've seen have used lighting and other production elements. Did like, that present any production yes. issues or creative? <laughs> <laughs> it's very, you know, in terms of the designs, the, the clothing is very black and white and silver and with just muted colors and the court is in sort of uh, dark purples and dark blues in, in winter in Sicilia. And, you know, it's easy to forget when you're working on this play, and we have to continually remind ourselves of it, is that for the first 20 lines, it's like the winter solstice party in Sicilia. It's a, it's a good place. It's not a bad place. So it's not like it has to be dark and scary. Then for the next two and a half acts, well, it is, uh, because suddenly a tyrant is there. Um, and, then, uh, uh, and then when we go to, I mean, I think it mostly is reflected in the costumes. You know, when we go to Bohemia, uh, the set does transform, and uh, I, think, uh, I think you'll be pleased by that transformation, but also the costumes are just uh, like a, a, a um, um, what's the word? 
um, an explosion of color and, and, and life. And, and, um, and you know, what's often also forgotten in the play is that you think of, well, Sicilia is the dark and stormy and dreadful place, and Bohemia is the light and joyful and frolicky and funny place, but actually, this, 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 what Shakespeare is deeper than that, and, and wonderful, funny things happen in Sicily, and and really horrible, angry, and um, just as awful things happen in, in Bohemia. So he is showing both sides of the coin, and then um, uh, and then they, they, at the end of the play, the hot of, as I like to say, the hot of Bohemia and the cold of Sicilia are fused in a moment of, of warmth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got a good closing note. Thanks, you guys. Have a great, good <laughs>